the Bain Free Radio Hour. An award-winning and well-reviewed author with a career spanning the last decade and more, Howard Andrew Jones's works are infused with a profound sense of history. Howard served as editor of Black Gate in addition to creating a number of Harold Lamb collections of short fiction, reviving Mr. Lamb's legacy in the public perception, all while penning several of his own excellent fantasy series. The Chronicles of Hanovar is his most recent work, brought to you by Bain Books. The third book in that series, Shadow of a Smoking Mountain, is just hitting shelves now. Howard could not be with us here today, so instead, the Bain Free Radio Hour has assembled a, four, a team of four esteemed guests whom I will now allow to introduce themselves because I keep mumbling a little bit. We'll start with you, Tony. Um, hi, I'm Tony Weisskopf. I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief of uh, Bain Books, and I am a huge Howard Andrew Jones fan and a huge Hanavar fan. Um, so we can we can talk about separating author from, from main character, but um, but I love them both, so... Casey? Hi, I'm Casey Ezel. Uh, I write science fiction and fantasy, and uh, I too am a Hanovar fangirl, um, as well as a Howard Andrew Jones fan. Uh, Howard is a uh, phenomenal human being. I had the privilege of meeting him uh, a couple years ago, shortly after the first Hanovar book came out. I think I sent him an email or, or something that gushed about how amazing uh, I thought it was, and we struck up a friendship. And uh, He's turns out he's a, a very smart man with very good advice for young authors, which I am am gleeful to have uh, have had the opportunity to receive. And Mark Rigney. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm also a writer and a playwright, and I've known Howard because I have the good fortune to live about five miles from his doorstep. I've known him since about 2004 when our kids were both in a Montessori preschool class together and we quickly realized that we were both writing and I can talk more about that as we go. So it's me. Very cool. Melissa? Hey, I'm Melissa Oltoff. I also write sci-fi and fantasy and I am 100% a hand of our fangirl thanks to Casey Azell, who was like, you have to read this. And then I met <laughs> Howard and 100% a, a fan of Howard because he is a delightful person and just happy to be here. So speaking of, it sounds like for at least a couple of you, Hanavar was what brought you together. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you start with the first book in the series uh, uh, back in the day? Uh, Melissa, we'll go back to you in that, in that sense. Lord of the Shattered Land, the first book. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. It <clears throat> is amazing. It's absolutely the book I started with because I had, like I said, I had Casey like message to be like, girl, you need to read this book. Like now, right now, 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 now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I also had Jason Howard... Cordova doing the same thing. I'm like, all right, two people telling me to read this. <laughs> it's funny, Jason and I, we 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 don't always have the same taste, but occasionally we do. And when we do, it's it, it's funny because I, I hear a lot of people saying like, well, Jason said that I should read this and you said I should read this. You guys, mm -hmm. you guys don't always agree, but when you do, it's always really good. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, I... I also read Lord of a Shattered Land first, and I was I was just blown away by the complexity and 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 intricacy of just the character of Hanavar, um, because he's such a classic hero mm -hmm. in in the mold, uh, you know, like Conan and and you know all of these. Uh, adventure fantasy heroes right he's he's archetypical that way um but he's also a complex individual with complex motivations and drives and um and and he's competent and that's something that's entirely attractive to me as a as a reader and just as a human being you know cool. and mark did you happen to to read this uh, series before it started to go to market or not before no um but I first heard about Hanuvar in a different form. I want to say back in 2005, Howard was talking yeah. about Hannibal as a musical. And he'd written, I believe, a number of original songs. The name Hanuvar hadn't come into being yet, but Hannibal had been on his mind forever. I'm told Howard's <laughs> wife's name is Shannon. Mm -hmm. And Shannon has told me that on their second date, he was talking about Hannibal. And she was <laughs> wondering, why am I talking to this guy? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> seems entirely plausible <laughs> and, and apparently she liked the story and the subject matter because they're very yeah. much together. very cool 
And Tony, obviously, it was submitted, right? It, it was. Um, a credit where credit is due. Sean Korsgaard was a big advocate of uh, of Howard's and Howard's short, shorter work and brought him uh, to my attention. Um, so when Howard did submit uh, uh, the manuscript to me, I was I was primed to um, uh, to to look at it favorably. Um, and uh, I, I started reading, and uh, it's episodic, right? Um, now, of course, the the, right. the common stories are also episodic. They because they were published in uh, weird tales and uh, and the pulp magazines of the day. Um, and this one too the, had had uh, many of the stories were published in um, in the smaller sword and sorcery um, magazines uh, that we have now. Um, but the episodes seemed to be not random, right? Um, and mm -hmm. so my question in the middle of it was, tell me this builds. Does this build? Does this, does this, is this episodic uh, collection actually a novel? And Sean was like, yes, actually it is. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that it, 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 and it does. Um, so, uh, so that you, that, that you get this beautiful, um, uh, the, the building the the structure of the, of of the first book um, is is so solid, but uh, but also so seductive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when, when when you're reading it, you learn a little bit more about Hanavar and about the world with each complete story. Um, and uh, when I when I went back to him to make the offer, he's like, and there are more. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, well, good, because, cool. you know, you, see, you seem to be setting up more. So not only do, does does each volume build, but but they all build together. Right. The, yeah. the, the, there's a series structure that's going to be very satisfying um, uh, for the reader when uh, when we do get to see the completion but each but each volume stands on its own each story stands on its own and that is a hell of a trick to pull off for for any writer i'm in, i enjoyed the notes the the, the individual notes because it it gives you yeah. that it gives you that historian's perspective and being mm -hmm. alternate history writing and stuff like that i i really like that like oh okay so here's a couple of different points of view on what was just discussed or what we were just presented with uh, which is really uh, fascinating to me because it's it's not a it can't be easy to just do enough. Uh, I, I would wonder about the cutting room floor uh, or and that kind of thing as as to what yeah. scenes or what uh, little notes might have been cut out uh, because of you know uh, knowing that he really loved uh, the, uh, uh, the Hannibal and what he the character he's trying to transpose into this fantasy world. Uh, or certain elements of that character. So it's very well done. I, I, I'm impressed. Uh, I somehow I missed the memo. Casey never told me to, I absolutely must read the book. She did tell me, hey, you probably ought to try this. But, you were in the middle of moving, to yeah, be clear. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> they, well, the other thing too, is that we should acknowledge the part that Shannon plays um, as as Howard's yeah. first reader and first editor. Um, before before I even get to see anything, Howard is running is running scenes and running stories and running episodes by Shannon and and, and bouncing bouncing them off of her and, te and, and and using her as his first tester, um, mm -hmm. and uh, she's incredibly good at it. So I'm so happy that um, the young Shannon decided to keep dating um, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> Despite his apparent obsession with Hannibal. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, off. maybe it was a Later. feature. It was a yeah. feature. It's feature, right? not a bug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Mark, have you have you had opportunity to to give any kind of editing stuff or advice, or have you talked to him about the process and that kind of thing? Oh no, and th th that's the short answer. The longer answer is that for a long time, Howard and I loved talking about the books we were reading, but we didn't invite each other into the writing process. And we both got very busy raising kids. And so there was a period where we were uh, we were very tight and spent a lot of time together. And he invited me to join his Dungeons and Dragons group, which was a very special invite because he's been playing with some of these guys since high school and gals. And so we were seeing each other once a week, but we were basically focused on gaming and whatever our kids were up to. And only recently um, did Howard reach out and say, hey, I, I want to I want to spend time talking about process and craft, and I want to know what you're writing, and I'm going to show you what I'm writing. And 
he was about to hand over a whole bunch of pieces of his next hand of our notes, stories, and so on. Um, and as I think we know collectively, he has a diagnosis that is at the moment at least preventing that. So I've never read anything of Howard's in manuscript, but I do know that he writes a, in, by his own admission about 20 drafts before Shannon gets to see anything. And then it goes from there. So he's he's very process oriented and he takes his time and I think it shows. Yeah, yeah. He's very much a, a, a you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I, I've had the opportunity to have a, several conversations with Howard about sort of the craft and the art of writing fantasy, specifically adventure fantasy. Um, and the he was he's he's such a generous individual with his time because he set up this this wonderful almost like web course that he um he offered to uh, to me and to uh, Justin Watson who's my co-author for the Romanoff Rain series and uh Mona Lisa Foster who's another another Bane author because the three of us had just expressed interest in um you know at a con about how do you make these amazing vivid like with with how do you how do you make these amazing vivid worlds vivid scenes this this fantastic combat these great characters and yet you do it with such economy of like there's no there are no wasted words in a Howard Andrew Jones book none right um, part of it is because as Tony said they're they're episodic so each episode is a standalone story and yet mm -hmm. they are so beautifully linked in the you know in the sort of meta arc um and and howard was he was good enough to to share that with us um and you can see based on you know the information that he provided to us and and the way in which he provided the information this is something that the man has done a, a deep dive study on for most of his life i would imagine um just because he's really he, he's really such a subject matter expert right and like if if i wanted to learn to go write a fantasy combat scene howard andrew jones would be my first stop 100 percent. cool very cool uh and the uh the specifics of this is with the you know being a history guy uh, as well it kind of warmed the cockles of my heart that, that was one of the fascinating things for me was to to jump into this and still not be lost because i'm like okay here's what's going on with this third book and going oh I, this is i'm getting strong odor of carthage and rome and and uh, mm -hmm. boy did the romans not look good <laughs> in this version of, of it not even a little so which is also something i appreciated because they they're generally considered like if not the heroes then certainly uh, uh admired for their achievements in overcoming the Carthag carthaginians and everybody else uh on their rise to power so um one of the things about this uh, this book, how many were there uh, initially to be uh, in the story arc? Because it sounds as if he's been plotting this for some time. Uh, so I, I think the original plan was for four. Um, so your standard Bane trilogy, right? right. <laughs> Going to be a nice compact four. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in 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 the writing of two and three, it was clear that it was going to need at least five, um, and six six really ought to do it. Um, so 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 that is that that is the current plan. Um, and one of one of the one of those five is the the plan is for that to be um, mostly about um, Hanavar's daughter um and 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 her adventures um because it, because plot what plot needs and uh what what happens with her is going to be important to the climax and I, i'm just sort of channeling weber here it's like i have to tell this side tale separately as its own novel because it's important to honor's timeline okay <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so i'm I am familiar with this argument, um, but uh, but 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 uh, yeah, and and I'm excited about that because Hanavar's daughter, even just the emanations that we're getting, right, the, the mm -hmm. seeing the reactions of the people around here, seeing uh, seeing the trail of her path through time, even if we don't get to to see her, we already know she's going to be she's a fascinating character. Um, so uh, so. So hopefully we do get to see that, um, and I know it's there, right? I know yeah. I know what Howard's plan is, um, and um, and and I'm ex I'm excited by it. I'm excited by it. Um, yeah, but, yeah. 
So I'm just I, too when when I started reading um, Lord of a Shattered Land, I almost immediately started thinking of Robert E. Howard, and I started thinking of Roy Roy Crinkle. Um, and I just wanted to to share. I, I have some Roy Roy Crinkle artwork here. Let's see if we can we can get that there. Just yeah, so cool. yeah, just the raw sp spirit. Thank you, dog. Of uh. Uh, of sword and sandals <laughs> um, really has come through with Howard's work. And I think I think it's worth noting, right, that three of our panelists here and, and three very enthusiastic readers of Howard's work are ladies, right? I think there's a perception um, that sword and sorcery and sword and sandals is is very much a, a gentleman's genre. Um, but but I but I don't think it is, right? I think when it's I think when it's done well, it appeals. It appeals to everybody, and can appeal to everybody. I don't. I don't know, Mark. What, what, what's What's your perception of that? Um, I tend to think that anyone can pick up any story, and if it's well told, they'll follow along. Uh, with, yeah. With Bar in particular, the thing that I like about the character best is what I like about really all of Howard's adventure fiction, and it's yes to the economy, and yes to the successful handling of episode and, and long arc at the same time. But the thing I like about Handy Bar is he would rather avoid combat at all costs. He's capable of it, but he's not a superhero in spandex. And he's perfectly aware that even faced by one opponent, he could get hurt. And Howard has a definite awareness of how frail even a very strong individual can be. Um, Howard's a third degree black belt in karate. You wouldn't know it if you just walk up to him and say hello, because he's going to smile at you. He's not going to knock you down. But the way he treats Hanuvar is that at any given moment, Hanuvar has to assume he's going to lose. And so he does his very best to outthink his opponents. And I would much prefer to read a book where where our skilled superhero is, is capable of thinking ahead, planning, forming alliances, complicated alliances. And that's mm -hmm. what I see on the page as I read through these. Well, that was one yeah, of the for things sure. that really set Hanavar apart for me was that he wasn't on that mission for revenge or anything. Even though he had very good reason to want revenge, he was he was out to save his people. And hearing Howard say that at the Bane uh, Roadshow, oh, chills, right? Yeah. <laughs> Literal goosebumps. <laughs> like he's going to find his people and set them free. Yeah. And that that message of hope just infused everything that he did with these books. And it keeps it from being an otherwise very dark and grim story. It, it it makes you feel hopeful and you root for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Griffin, what you said about like, you know, it doesn't really paint the Durvins in the best light, but there are good characters. There's good people on that side too. And he captured that so well. It's yeah. so much fun reading it. Yeah, yeah and, and it's, it. Go ahead, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> it, it's it he does howard does such a good job of getting a lens at the on the human experience right like um hanavar is a thinking man's hero uh just like mark was saying right he's he's and and it's that piece of him that makes him so intensely competent um that you believe that he is the greatest general of the ancient world right like you he makes that believable because he's the kind of guy whose first answer is not to go in you know, and and swing his sword around and murder hobo a village, right? He's 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 a strategist. He's a thinker, um, and he's a feel. One of the other things that I love so much about Hanavar is that we get the we get his emotions. We get to feel what it feels like to be this man who's who's you know people have been his his nation's been destroyed. His people have been scattered and enslaved. He's looking for his daughter. Um, and, and, and one of the other like little pieces that I love so much about, about just the way Howard did this was, you know, we know that from the beginning, what I just said, but mm -hmm. as we go along, we realize, you know, we get these, these breadcrumbs and these little pieces of, of, of data about his relationship with his daughter, Hanavar's relationship with his, mm -hmm. with his adult daughter. And we realize that it's not just cut and dried. It's not just a, you know, I'm going to cut through the the superpower of the ancient world to find my kid. There's more to it than that, right? There's a there's a complexity to that relationship and it's it's beautiful and it's heartbreaking and it's um it just makes you feel all the things, right? So <laughs> um and that's what you want, right? That that's what you want in your fantasy adventure is something to make you feel something, I think. At least that's what I want. Well, and 
and he makes it very clear howard makes it very clear that hanover cares deeply mm -hmm. not just for the people that he's directly responsible for but just random people random durbins um, that he runs across yeah and he he makes you he never makes you feel like hanover is less than a masculine like manly character for feeling that deeply and it's it's just yeah. beautifully done yeah yeah he's sexy i'm gonna go ahead and say it hanover is sexy and it's Hanover's that competence fangirl. right it it is it's i mean and it's funny too that i feel this way because he howard's not shy about saying yeah the dude's old <laughs> <laughs> you know he's, he's not a spring chicken but he definitely has silver fox vibes um and it is it is that competence it's that complexity mm -hmm. it's that 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 thinking man's piece of it that that really makes him such a compelling character one it's of the things I'm, I'm kind of noting as well in this uh sorry mark uh one of the things i'm noting in this is uh, that despite it being episodic and uh which is very much robert e howard kind of kind of thing mm -hmm. There is this, and the the one problem I always had with Conan, and I have a lot of Conan, like I've got Savage Sword to Conan, all of the magazines, like I'm a huge Conan fan, is that he never really changes. Uh, he he kind of is pretty static. Uh, he, you know, despite having a son, he never really kind of, we don't get to delve into that very much with uh, with the Robert E. Howard work into the, to the same degree that we're seeing it in Howard's work, then and, yeah. and despite it being equally episodic in its first thing, it's much more. There's a much more of a through tale that you can actually trace rather than oh, we're just going to assemble a bunch of short stories and make it a timeline uh, kind of deal. So it's really fascinating to me that what he's done, uh, you know, perhaps being in, a bit inspired by historical figures, but also by you know Robert E. Howard uh, and that sword and sandals thing. He's taken a, a mm -hmm. genre that is almost entirely episodic uh, or generally so and made it a uh, co cohesive narrative over multiple books that's a very impressive feat to me uh, i'm sorry mark i interrupted you i just wanted to get that in there too yeah i would just kind of say in terms of the optimism that he seems to be bringing to this to me a lot of that comes from howard's uh, i don't want to say addiction but devotion to all things Star Trek, Howard is a terrific Trekkie. Mm. I've, seen, I've seen my share of Star Trek, but even after multiple viewings of multiple episodes, I can't name every title and I can't name the writer who worked on it, but Howard can. And, <laughs> and what he's gotten out of that is, is the Gene Roddenberry approach to the universe, which is things can get better. And, mm -hmm. and Andrew Barr's Trek is all about the legacy of, of young Howard watching that stuff and, and the lesson taken is, yeah, we can, we can improve. We can, it's going to be really hard, but we can move through this and, and have a better world. Very cool. Yeah. Well said. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think the, the net effect is, is that we, we get, we get all of the things that we want from sword and sorcery from a sword and sorcery story, but as as we read more and more and more we also the effect ends up being epic so it ends up being not only sword and sorcery but also epic fantasy which again is a very tricky thing to pull off you usually get one or the other you don't you don't usually get to have both pleasures um and getting back to hanovar the the character um I, 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 as as different from a um series tv show or 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 conan is that the later hanovar is affected by the people that he meets along the way right yes he's, he's affected by the relationships that he has that we read on the page um he's affected by his buddy right who's 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 the, the, the chronicler whose words we're we're getting right um he's his actions are uh, are changed because of these relationships um, and we, the reader, get to see that on the page. And that's that's part of what makes it uh, such a deep, I think, satisfying feeling. Um, but also the footnotes. I mean, the footnotes are great, right? Yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. I was just thinking about that in particular, about the the two children uh, early on in the first act that that kind of uh, they wander off, but are they they wander off for a reason. And then his his discussion, the the chronicler's discussion of talking to them many many years later, and what it was they had experienced when they wandered off, not to give anything away, right. uh, and, and how that uh, was different from 
Panovar's initial take on the situation and and that kind of thing. So uh, another really cool mechanism to allow us insight into Hanovar's misperceptions of what's going on around him in the world. And then he also, at the same time, uh, you know, Hanovar uh, gives, uh, I, I always forget the bad empire's name, uh, their their culture people. He's like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. he was raised in a slaveholding culture, so he doesn't have the visceral temperament about slaveholding that I do, uh, yeah. which is a great way to give the readers, the reader permission to, okay, uh, I don't have to hate everybody just because they're this particular culture. Uh, and I thought that was really impressive, but also that Hanovar is going through life, taking individuals as individuals, uh, which is the best we can all do, right? Is mm -hmm. not, you know, it, stereotypes are a real time saver, but they're rarely accurate <laughs> beyond being a time saver. So being able to actually, you know, look at this and go, hey, these are these things that are going on and they're horrible in this culture, but this individual has done right by me every time I've given them an opportunity to uh, and you know, entrust them with my whatever it may be. So really impressive, uh, not just from a character standpoint, but also from a writer standpoint, just kind of, hey, things can get better. If we give people an opportunity to be better, they may let us down. They may let us down really, really badly, but they may also just surprise us with their ability to do much, much better. Um, I really think yeah. that's in, impressive and very much in line with what you were saying, Mark, about the the Trekkie in them. Uh, I, I, I get that uh, feeling very uh, intensely, too. I, I I appreciate that. That's cool. Yeah, I think I, I think it's an interesting I mean, again, just the way Howard handled all of these all of these things is just so masterful. Um, I, I can't I can't really stop gushing about it. So you guys are welcome. Um, but one of one of the other things that I just really really admire is is two things. One, when we start at the beginning of Lord of a Shattered Land, we are effectively in the middle of Hanavar's overall story. He's already the greatest general that the ancient world has ever seen or that that world has ever seen. And we don't know why. We kind of have to take everyone's word for it, right? Right. Um, but but we have this this amazing killer like sword and sandal adventure story that, that just kind of draws you in and kicks you off and makes you want to give him time. And Howard uses that time extremely well because two things happen. One, throughout the course of his his adventures in the Durban Empire, trying to find his people and set them free. We continuously go back and revisit Hanuvar did prior to the destruction of Volantis, mm -hmm. which is his home, his home city, um, you know, AKA fantasy Carthage. Um, and, uh, and, and so we keep having these callbacks and he, he, we meet people from his past to include his, his former enemies and which brings me to point two is that so many of the connections that we see Hanavar make that are that become his allies that become and minor spoilers perhaps but um but we we see him make connections with people that he does that he has every reason to hate except that he does what griffin says and takes them as individuals and looks at their overall circumstance and meets them with I guess a sort of compassion for for you know universal human frailty because he recognizes it in himself as well, um, and and it, it again masterfully done, beautifully done. It's the kind of thing that you know, as Melissa would say, it's career goals, right? Like I want to write stories mm -hmm. that do that. I want to have characters that do things like that. So he's very inspirational. Well, we we should point out too that when when we start out in Lord of the Shattered, he is. Uh, it, it is essentially naked and alone, right? Yeah. Uh, he is literally in a loincloth. Thank you, Howard. Um, <laughs> just, just a, a boon to to. Like I said, the man is sexy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but he but he starts out at the the lowest point in Hanovar's life, right? Mm -hmm. So it is it is in the middle, or even you know towards you know the latter the the latter part of it, um, uh, but. But that's why I think that starting point works, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and again, it's you know it it it's, it goes back to that Gene Roddenberry. Things can get better. It's a very American approach to uh, 
uh, you know, to the world. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and that's lovely, right? It's lovely to see on the page. So, um, and it works. It, it absolutely works. So, the line about the moral oh. art universe oh. transferred into sword and sandal. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So getting into more, maybe more specifics, uh, what what character, I usually do this with the people I'm interviewing for the Bain Free Radio Hours, so uh, what character of this series uh, would you want to be your sidekick, aside from Hannibal? Because I think it's a pretty agreeable that everybody's going to be Hannibal, right? Sure. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, so, go ahead, Tony. No, I was I was just gonna say, I mean, if I can't have the same guy chronicling my life as is chronicling Hanovar, that would be super awesome because I would turn out very well, right? <laughs> yeah, for um, sure. And, and anyone he's also else, incredibly useful, right? <laughs> did anyone else transfer like a, an early James Earl Jones voice onto uh, onto the chronicler? <laughs> I did. <laughs> just that works. That works. I didn't, but I will I will now. <laughs> so he was my pick too. So right. Yeah. 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 Uh, I also really love the Chronicler. I, and I, I wanted to, I, I'm glad we're talking about him because I wanted to come back to this too, because one of the Howard's frame narrative uh, that kind of ties all these stories together is, is great because you actually, you're actually viewing it through the lenses of two Chroniclers because there's the original Chronicler that, that travels with Hanavar, but then there's the scholar that abridged everything. And at very early on in the frame narrative, we are informed, yes, uh, in fact, I think it's it might be right there on page one, we are informed that this guy is abridging and editing. And he's like, this may be what happened, this may not be, I've changed some things for the purpose of scholarship and entertainment, you're welcome. So it's a very cool twist on the like unreliable narrator that because, you know, we're discussing now it's a fantasy world and magic exists and people accept that. Um, but, but I, I loved that piece of it as much as, as the rest of it, because again, it comes back to this idea of, well, who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? Well, it depends on who you are. You know, it depends on who you're talking to. It depends on the situation that you're in. Um, and, uh, and you think, you know, at the very beginning and you're right at the very beginning, but then later on that changes slightly. And it's interesting. And it, I, I, I find that so fascinating because one of my one of my like articles of faith when it comes to writing is the whole every every villain is the hero of his own story, right. um, and the corollary to that, which is that every hero, wait, what did I say it wrong? Every villain I, is the hero of his own story, yeah. but every hero is potentially the villain of someone else's story, right? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so um so i love i love that awareness of that because again it comes back to that that idea of we are responsible for, we are responsible for how we treat other people things can get better but we have to work at it like we you know and 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 there's it's that morality piece that mark was mentioning and i totally got off topic um aside from the chronicler my <laughs> my pick for for sidekick would probably be um there's a sorceress character that we meet in book two. Oh, um, and good. I love her. I think she's, I think she's awesome. And I, I would probably choose her. <laughs> Melissa? Since I can't have Hanavar, I would pick as my sidekick, the closest equivalent on the Durban side, I would pick uh, Cyprian. Oh, yes. Yes. I love him too. He's amazing. Like, the relationship that Hanavar and Cyprian have is one of my favorites throughout this whole series. Like the respect those two men have mm -hmm. for each other when in all honesty, they should have had like an adversarial relationship and they don't, they have that mutual respect and appreciation because they're literally two geniuses in the same mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. And they have that, that bond and just the dry witty sense of humor that Howard infused with their conversations, especially mm -hmm. in book two. The elephant cookie part made me cackle so hard. I was in the office <laughs> and I goose honked and it was amazing. I got lots of side eyes from people. I'm like, read this book. Trust me. You can get, you can have your own goose honking. It's awesome. I, I would choose him. He's, he's amazing. I love his character. Yeah. I might change my answer too. Cause I, I also love Cyprian. Right. And back to Griffin's point about things being historically inspired. 
I like to imagine that that was the the relationship between Scipio Africanus and and you know the original uh, Hannibal Hannibal Barca, right? Right. Um, I don't know. That was a really long time ago. I don't know if anybody knows, but <laughs> but but the that that trope of you know these genius generals who have this respect for one another's mm -hmm. talent and and prowess and military honor. genius and honor. Yeah, that's that's powerful stuff, man. Right. And Mark? Well, I know what I should say, uh, because I spend a lot of time in the theater. I should say Antarius, who becomes one of the chroniclers, like right. first, first round chronicler. And I do love the guy, but the character that I'm hoping Howard will bring back, and I haven't seen him yet. So this is uh, this is book two, right? City of, mm -hmm. yes. of Blood. I'm almost at the end of book two. I haven't gotten to book three. But there's a guy in the first book named Rufus who shows up in a story called The Autumn Horse. And I wrote a piece for this in, I put it up on Black Gate uh, because I was very struck by how Howard diverged from the tone of the rest of the stories and suddenly went for comedy. I was reading through the story and it took me about halfway through it before I thought, this is this is inspired by Wodehouse. This is like Worcester and Jeeves. And sure yeah. enough, there's this Roman dandy named Rufus who Hanuvar in disguise is suddenly tasked with teaching to ride a horse and maybe <laughs> hold a weapon. And the beautiful thing about Rufus is he thinks he's really good at this stuff and doesn't realize that he's not and is so happy about everything that it doesn't matter, right? His own goodwill just carries him right through. And so Hanuvar becomes quite taken with him. He's initially thinking, well, this guy's a jerk and he's on the wrong side. But instead, <laughs> it's more like, I love this kid. So I want <laughs> Rufus to come back. Um, and the more often, the merrier, because the humor that does pop up in some of these stories uh, can blindside you a bit, because most of the stories aren't funny. But every so often, Howard says, you know what? Life is funny. Let's just... Just a little yeah. bit of humor at the right moment. It's it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So here's well, to Rufus. And yeah, Rufus is a great character. But and, and, and Howard does this in reverse too because there's a and i cannot remember the name of the the section or the chapter but there's also a straight up horror story um, yeah yeah the one that i'm thinking of is is you know um uh hanavar and uh antari Ant is antari i always get his name wrong yeah sure. they they end up they go to like a, a villa basically and they're in disguise and they um they're there with like a group of other people to include some of the revenants who are the the Durban like special soldiers that are that are like they're all on a mission to find Hanavar because they think he's still alive and they end up trapped in this villa and it's like a slasher flick where people get like taken taken out one by one and and there's a huge twist and it's and it's awesome and it's very cool um but it's a straight up horror story and it's beautifully done and beautifully woven into the larger narrative and into those larger themes that we were talking about of sometimes the good guy really isn't the good guy. Sometimes the bad guy, it really isn't the bad guy, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that, that, that individual piece was one of, one of the ones where like I finished reading it and I had to put the phone down and be like, I gotta, I, I think that might've been one of the times when I was like, Melissa, you need to read this because I have to talk about it. <laughs> right like there's there it's it's just like he he sprinkles in magic right like yeah. these these demonic or or godly or or just otherworldly forces but it's not overwhelming so when you get to right. one of those those episodes or or little stories where it's like oh oh this is this is not he's not fighting men he's fighting mm -hmm. something else and that i think it was in book 2 when he uh there's another horror one where like uh the chronicler needs like you know healing and aid and he mm -hmm. knows of this place in the mountains without giving too much away like that oh, one yes, i love that one right yes. that yeah. one like like goosebumps of the oh dear god are all my lights on variety because it was yep. so well executed yeah that i was like my dog barked and i almost screamed and it was amazing <laughs> <laughs> so well done like he just <laughs> He, he he occasionally varies from the the sword and, and and sorcery and the the high fantasy into like horror or into comedy, but never so far that it feels wrong. It just it right. flows so well. Well, life right. is where life is full of horrors and comedy and drama, and maybe not so many swords and sandals anymore. But you know that's the, the I'm getting the sense that this I mean, is where his achievement shines is. Yeah, uh, in that in representing uh, all the complexities of these characters. So well, yeah, and for sure. it's worth remembering that Howard is a dedicated role player. 
And yeah. you know, if you play yeah. enough D&D or associated games, there is a monster at the end of this book, right? Mm -hmm. That's just, that's what happens. And so to have, Han as soon as you admit magic into the universe of Hanyavar, he's going to dip into horror because the mm -hmm. enemy is going to use uh, magic against him. And sometimes mm -hmm. he's going to try and use magic against them. And some of the things they experiment with are necessarily horrific. So mm -hmm. it, I think that's part of why it blends nicely. But yeah, never never forget the D&D &D player in him. Um, <laughs> he's a great yeah. person. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it, it is. It, yeah, it's, it's a setting that is eminently role playable too. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I, I hope we'll get to see development of it is in the in that direction as well but yeah I, I wanted to touch on the 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 magic in the universe right so this is not a simple um alternate history right it is a uh, it is a fantasy universe and the magic is important to the universe um we, we we have a i think there's a twitter or x kerfuffle going on now about um uh about somebody saying you have to do magic this way and uh somebody else saying no you have to do magic this way and larry korea coming down and saying you can do magic however you want to do magic magic is a tool it's magic. i saw that yeah. <laughs> right. right um so so larry's actually got very sensible um a, approach to how you use magic in fantasy um and howard in 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 this series is using magic more in the it's it doesn't have rivets right it it's it's it is essentially unknowable um and that's how his um that that's how the people of uh, of this universe approach it but they also try to manipulate it right mm -hmm. um and uh, so there's a little bit of there, there's a little bit of we're trying to figure out a system so that we can control this thing that is essentially uncontrollable um but also there are dragons right um there right. are there, the right? <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, well, so and that's, yeah. that's what I love so much about that sorceress character. Uh, yeah, I, I was trying to be somewhat deliberately vague because, you know, it because of spoilers, but she, she's a villain, right? She's one of the revenants that is that is searching for Hanavar, but she's such an interesting character. And she is doing exactly what Tony was talking about is that her whole focus is on I have access to these these magical forces. Mm -hmm. Let me manipulate them. Let me utilize them. Let me let me try to control them. And keyword being try, right? Like it's <laughs> I I love her. I love that character and I love the, the Howard's approach to that like you said force that is essentially in it in its essence unknowable. But but the thing, but you know, we were talking about the even head of this, right? It's mm -hmm. not pure horror, right? It's not Lovecraft's mm -hmm. approach to the uncontrollable, which is this is this is very, very scary and you should be scared and just we should be scared of this. But it's also this is incredibly wonderful and mm -hmm. and and you should enjoy this, right? Yeah. I think so there was without again, without spoiling, um, there was that one scene where we're you know Hanover he yeah. runs afoul of magic right like and he has he has some adventures as as a uh, direct result of it but at the end of the day like that had to be fixed or he was going to perish and how it ends up getting fixed was so beautiful because he ends up where yes. he shouldn't be and right like he gets to see mm -hmm. oh that part that part made me cry I'm not even gonna me lie. too it was so yeah. beautiful that he got that that opportunity to to see that particular side, and I'm trying so hard not to spoil. Like y'all, you have to you have to read it. It's it's, it's gonna get to that part. You yeah. know what I'm talking about. It's the crux of the second book, really, oh. and it's and it's gorgeous. Yeah. It's so beautiful. So, uh, Mark, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, some of his Black Gate work? Mm. You know, I, I know less about his Blackgate work as individual pieces and more about how John O'Neill, publisher there, feels about Howard's um, impact, which is, I think John had reached a point, having founded Blackgate and set it up as this um, archive of all things fantasy and science fiction, where people could come and stop by and find reviews of new work, reviews of old work, touch on hard-boiled stuff, touch on film, and kind of have a one clearinghouse for all of that. And I think he found it was too much. Um, he he run out of time in his own life to manage it. And Howard um, and John, I guess, met at a con and Howard was, was invited into the fold and then just knocked it out of the park that he took over as managing editor. 
and found new people to contribute and I think maybe helped raise the bar for the consistency of the articles that appear in terms of having a, a good standard of, of what contributors are going to do prose wise and, and ideas wise. And the result eventually was that Blackgate, uh, I believe it was the World Fantasy Award that it won. And I think I like to think deservedly so. And you know, John, the first person John congratulated was Howard, even though Howard was not currently on the masthead anymore. In fact, I think he may still be on the masthead because John refused to take him off, if wow. I recall. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's my take on his contribution to Blackgate. And I'm, my connection to Blackgate is all because Howard said, you should write some articles for, for this. And I said, what's Blackgate? And well, I learned. So now I'm, I'm one of their veteran contributors and I count John O'Neill as a friend. And I thank Howard for that. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, that one of the things that I, that has helped me and Casey and everybody is, is a rising tide raises all boats. And the authors that mm -hmm. that really uh, contributed to that ideal uh, have a lot of traction with me and and uh, others that uh, have experienced that uh, benefit uh, and the benefits of people like that, uh, Chuck Gannon and uh, Bain itself, you know, that was one of their primary uh, things starting out or that attracted me to it was their master and journeyman approach to to uh, mm -hmm. dual uh, authored novels where, you know, Dave Drake and Steve Sterling or uh, Pornell and you know, all these different uh, authors that uh, we got to read more work by them, but it was also in uh, cooperation with a, an author that was perhaps uh, slightly less or much less well known. Um, it was a very neat thing. And so, yeah, I totally uh, uh, dig that. And not having met uh, Howard, but once, I believe, at one of the conventions, uh, I, I appreciate that much all the more because it, it is uh, so important to the genre to also to be kind of evergreen and to mm -hmm. develop these new talents and to help other people get along and to show, to live by example, really, of how you want to be and how you want to be perceived in the world. So uh, much appreciation to that uh, aspect of it, because Casey was talking about it earlier, too, about yeah. how much she was able to to garner from just by mentioning, hey, I'd like to know more. And he's like, well, would you like to know more? And yeah, you know, <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Uh, he's Yeah. Let's talk for a moment about Howard himself, right? Like, he's such a humble dude. I mean, this man wrote a book that I gushed all over, and I'm I I don't know how I managed. I think it was a connection through Sean Korsgaard because I think I had told Sean, and Sean's like, "Well, you should tell Howard." And all of a sudden, I know next thing I know is I'm I'm texting him via like Facebook Messenger or something. But I'm I basically I was just like, "This book was amazing. It was my favorite book that I've read all year. This is like the kind of stuff that I have not been able to find since I was a kid," mm -hmm. and. This is the kind of stuff that I I desperately want to write. And Howard was just like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for, I mean, he was so humble. He was so approachable. He continues to be this way. Mm -hmm. um, even knowing that I like have labeled myself as a hashtag Hanovar fangirl all over social media, right? Um, We're going to make it tread. We are. That we are. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> and um, uh, you, you know, he's, he's, he's a, he's a perfect gentleman. He's, he's, uh, um, friendly and fun and not pretentious at all. And every convention I go to that Howard is at, I'm always like, I want to steal time away from everybody else who is at this entire thing that I want to talk to. All these big names, all these fans, everything. But please let me have an hour to sit in the hotel bar and talk to Howard about fantasy and about Hanavar and about just, you know, life and kids and and, oh, and gosh, right? you know working and writing and because he's 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 happy to talk with you about all of those things and it's it's fantastic he's a he's a wonderful human being i'm so grateful to you know consider him i i i'm i'm envious of mark because you guys live close enough to be like legit real life friends um but i'm so grateful to consider him at least a writer friend or a con friend you know yeah to bounce off that like he's Probably one of the, I mean, you, when you go to, to cons like Liberty Con in particular, like everybody is mm -hmm. very approachable and very generous with their time, very friendly. Bar Con is the best because we all hang out. But Howard is like, he takes it to an, another level, right? Like he's yeah. just so friendly and so genuine. Like you, there is no doubt whatsoever when he says something to you that he means it. Like he, um, he, he was like, so when do I get to read your short story? And when I picked myself up off the floor... <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, like I, it was at Dragon Con last year, like so 2023 when I got second place in the uh adventure contest. And he's he just he gives this rousing like mm-hmm. speech on his book and you get the goosebumps and then just all cash was like, so when I get to read your story, I'm like, okay. Yeah, but he's just that that's that's exactly the kind of person he is, right? Like he wants to mentor people, he's very generous with his time, yeah. and he gives such wonderfully well like just it's not critical right like he gives very good feedback and advice but it's it's never couched in and it's never mean it's like right here's what i see here's what you could be doing better here's what i love Mm -hmm. and he's very very good about like phrasing it in that way like this is what i really like and you Mm -hmm. you can't doubt that he means it because he's just so enthusiastic about it yeah i would i would be remiss if i didn't acknowledge that that you know, I had a very similar conversation with with Howard after you know reading, um, I, after reading Lord of Shatterland and um, and City of Marvel and Blood. Uh, you know, book two came out. I gushed all over it. I was like, "This is amazing." Um, I told him that, and he was like, "I'm so glad you like it." Mm-hmm. What should I read of yours? And um, I again, like Melissa said, I was floored that he would even answer or even at, uh, offer. Right. Um, but being the uh, you know mercenary uh, uh, situation <laughs> capitalist that I am, I was like, well, you know, uh, if I'm honest, what I would really love for you to read is my is my current work in progress, which is a a, a fantasy novel. Um, and he was like, I'm in. Let me know. He's like, as soon as you're done with it, send it to me, and I'll beta read it. And he did. Um, and he gave me such just like Melissa said, it was it was incisive critique, but it was not it was not criticism no. if i can draw if i can split that hair right it was in, it was incredibly valid incredibly thoughtful incredibly constructive um and it and i was able to use that to make it a, a better book so much so that tony bought it and it'll come out next summer it's called mage light yeah. well, <laughs> so. and, and that's the thing like he is he's incredibly supportive about you yeah. know with younger authors like he wants to see us succeed and he's willing to take the time out of his day to, to have conversations with us. And it's, it's just, it's amazing. Yeah. He really, he's well, he's, he's he, we, we should, someone we should to make, emulate for sure. We should make it clear that this is not an invitation to anybody to randomly <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> the, oh, don't the, send the, Howard your manuscript. <laughs> no, no, not what we does. At, at his request uh, uh, right. on invitation only. Okay. Let's just be, let, let us be clear about that. Okay. <laughs> Um, and and for writer for writers who are paying it forward, you should know too. That's how you do it, right? You request. Yes. You don't. You don't have people just assume, right? Right. Okay. Correct. Yeah. 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 Fair points. Good, Good caveat. Point. Thanks, Tony. Whenever Howard comes back from a con, he will tell me. And I really haven't gone to cons, uh, which is that's a separate issue for another day. But <laughs> comes back. What he what he expresses frustration about is not. Um, meeting other writers, that's what he wants more of. What he says Mm -hmm. is, you know, I understand why cons are the way they are, and he likes being on panels, but the panels take away from the time that he has to approach each of you and say, what have you got? Tell me about what you're working on. Because he loves that, and he loves all the the authors that he meets there, and he wishes he could spend more time with each of you and or us. So, yeah, here's to more of that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we're coming to an end of uh, today's uh, Bain Free Radio Hour. We're approaching that hour limit. Uh, if each of you could tell us where we could find you next and uh, what you'll be doing, uh, and also just want to make sure we make that final plug for uh, Shadow of the Smoking Mountain, which is going to be coming out, or it's actually out right now. Uh, mm-hmm. at, uh, please at your, find it at your independent bookstores or those other places where you can find books. Uh, we would much, very much appreciate it. But uh, in the meantime, if you'd please let us know where we can find you next and uh, what projects you might have coming on the uh, horizon. Uh, we'll start with you, Melissa. Well, as soon as I'm done here, I'm jumping in my car to drive to uh, Helen, Georgia for Deep South Con. So I'll be there this weekend with Yay. Marisa Wolf and a number of other awesome authors. It's going to be a good time. You can find me online at melissaoltoff.net. And I've got a few projects uh, on the horizon, so um, secrets for now, but we'll, uh, we'll talk about them when I can. And you just released an urban fantasy. I did. I did just have an urban fantasy novel come out. It, if you like, you know, urban fantasy romance, enemies to lovers vibes, then Shadows May Fall. It'll be fun. Cool. Casey? 
Uh, my name is Casey Isel. Uh, immediately after this, I am going to go give my kid a math worksheet so I can read uh, Shadow of the Smoky Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I I pre-ordered the book, but I told myself that I couldn't read it until I finished my draft, which I finished last night. So yay for me. Yeah, you did. Congratulations. <laughs> Clever time management. Right. That's right. That's reward. Right. <laughs> so today's reward day. Um, but uh, yeah, you can find me online at uh, caseyezel.net. Uh, and um, I have, uh, in December, uh, I have an alternate history coming out with Tom Kratman and Justin Watson called 1919 Romanov Rising. Um, it is uh, uh, not fantasy. I mean, it's fantasy in that it's alternate history, um, but um, it is very much, you know, hard bitten military uh, alternate history, what would happen if some of the Romanovs survived to give a purpose to the anti-Bolshevik factions in the Russian Civil War. So um, if that's your jam, please check that out. Mark? Oh, uh, well, online you can find me at markrigney.net, and I have a novel that came out this past summer called Vinyl Wonderland, set in a 1980s used record shop where you really should not go through the door at the back of the shop. And Ooh. Howard is one of the people who blurbed the book, so therefore it must be good. Um, Very cool. At, at least according to Howard. It's not my job to decide I whether it's his opinion. Or not. I yeah, that. I do too. <laughs> uh, in terms of where I'll be next, besides right here at home writing on whatever's next, I will be at a festival in Cincinnati called Books by the Banks, um, which I believe is November the 16th, but I might have that date wrong because, frankly, I hadn't thought I might need to promote that. Um, and that's what's going on in my life. Oh, cool. And Tony? Uh, well, obviously, I am at Bain.com. Um, in person, I'm going to be the Toastmaster for FenCon in Dallas in uh, February. Um, so uh, you guys, uh, I hope you can catch me there. So look, looking forward to that. Very cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. We much appreciate it for this appreciation of Howard Andrew Jones and uh, his latest, latest work, Shadow of the Smoking Mountain. This has been Griffin Barber for the Bain Free Radio Hour. Have a good evening. And now we bring you our audiobook serialization of Tinker by Wynne Spencer. Inventor girl genius Tinker lives in a near future Pittsburgh, which now exists mostly in the land of the elves. She runs her salvage business, pays her taxes, and tries to keep the local ambient level of magic down with gadgets of her own design. When a pack of wargs chase an elven noble into her scrapyard, life as she knows it takes a serious detour. Tinker finds herself taking on the Elven Court, the NSA, the Elven Interdimensional Agency, technology smugglers, and a college-minded xenobiologist as she tries to stay focused on what's really important, her first date. Armed with an intelligence the size of a planet, steel-toed boots, and a junkyard dog attitude, Tinker is ready to kick butt to get her first kiss. What the hell had she been thinking? Fully awake in the darkened room, Tinker listened to the whisper of Pony's breathing. He lay so close she could feel the warmth from his body, his well-defined, muscled body. If she put out her hand, she could touch his hard stomach, run her hand down his lean flank. Why had she thought sharing a bed would be a good idea? She had been scared and angry and frustrated when she went to bed. Now, for some inexplicable reason, she wanted to be held. No, more than held. All too easily, she could imagine being cradled naked in Pony's arms, his mouth on the nape of her neck, his strong hands cupping her breasts, their bodies thrusting together as his. That was a truly dangerous line of thought. You're a married woman, idiot. She loved Windwolf, so why was she suddenly lusting for Pony? Even pretending to be asleep became impossible. She opened her eyes and found that she could make out Pony's face, the shape of his mouth, the line of his nose, and the soft curve of his brow. Among the elves, she had taken his good looks for granted. After being surrounded by the Oni and their alien ideals of beauty, she saw him with new eyes. Looking at him shot something akin to a low-voltage current down through her body to her groin. What would it be like to kiss him? Would he taste like Windwolf? 
she turned over to resist the temptation to find out. Why was she feeling this way? She loved Windwolf, didn't she? Certainly, if she could choose, she would want Windwolf beside her. Did she desire Pony only as a stand-in for her husband? Did she only want someone bigger and stronger to make her feel safe and protected? Or did she love Windwolf only because of the sex? Would any sexy elf male do? What a stupid time to be worrying about it. Pony's honor would never allow anything to happen, and besides, she'd probably never see Windwolf again. The Oni were going to kill both of them as soon as the gate was done. There was no point pretending that Tom Tom wouldn't dispose of them in some cruel yet offhandedly casual method. The white of exposed bone flashed into her mind. She curled against the flare of fear and misery. I got away once, she reminded herself. I can do it again. What was the point of being a genius if she couldn't outthink her enemies? That was another installment in Win Spencer's Tinker. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer, Ruth Judkowitz. And good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.